In this video, we are reprinting and assembling our TVC controlled rocket. At the end, we are also conducting its first test flight. We developed this rocket over a year ago, launched it four times and got the up part working. The last video we uploaded on this project was over eight months ago and you might have seen that we have started our aerospace studies since. Due to the studies, we didn't get to work on Buffalo L recently, but now, in a semester break, this is going to change. In the meantime, we also got a huge 3D printer upgrade thanks to Bamboo Lab. We received the X1C, which can print carbon fiber reinforced filaments, as well as the automatic material system, which automatically detects the loaded filament and enables multicolor prints. This gear upgrade was what brought us back to the project, as we were intrigued by what the improved print quality could do to the accuracy of our stabilization system. Of course, I had to try out the multi-filament print option, so the first thing I printed was the Acental, in which I integrated the James Space logo. Up next, I reprinted all the other structural parts out of black and white PLA. The landing TVC hull, the flight computer hull, the landing leg attachment hull, the descent fitted hull, the parachute stator and the nose cone fairings. For the parts that require more structural stiffness, I opted to use ABS glass fiber. Those were the descent fins, the gears and the gear racks. As this filament choice is relatively brittle, I prefer to utilize PLA on the TVC mount and the engine block. When it comes to its assembly, it hasn't changed much compared to its last revision. But as I haven't taken you along the assembly process yet, I want to give you a brief rundown of the process. First, I started with the descent fin assembly. The fins are hinged around the upper corner and can fold inside the rocket. Two opposing fins are attached by a rubber band to pulls them open. Next, I assembled the backup parachute. The two nose cone fairings are hinge connected to the parachute stator. A screw on each of the insides of the parachute fairings allows the mounting of a rubber band that connects the two fairings and wants to pull them open. The parachute is just connected to the stator by a cable tie. The flight computer stack slides into the hull and is fixed by four screws in the actual direction. The landing legs assembly consists of four aluminum rods that are attached to the landing leg attachment hull. They are rotatable and limited by a sloping flat surface inside the part. I connected a rubber band from a screw on each of the legs to the inside of the hull to create the necessary opening tension. Balls on the tips of the legs allow for better impact performance. Both the ascent and the descent stage use an identical movable engine mount for active control. We are not using the throttle mechanism on the descent stage to keep it as simple as possible on the first attempt. To assemble the control mechanism, two 9G metal geared servos are installed in the TVC mount and fastened by two screws each. The inner gear rack is screwed to the engine block and the outer gear rack is mounted to the hull. It is important to home the servo positions to 90 degrees before starting to align the relative position of the engine block to the TVC mount. When it's aligned, the two gears are placed on the servo horns and are fastened the engine block attachment screws. The entire assembly slides into the hull and after proper alignment the two hinged screws are again added. After ensuring everything works on both TVCs, we can move on. The ascent stage features its own parachute, which is attached to a separate plate that is screwed into the ascent stage hull. The ascent stage also needs two guiding rods that allow for easy detachment, but also maintain proper positioning of the two stages. For automatic detachment, two springs are added to the attachment rods, and they are sewed to the hull to prevent them from getting loose. With the physical assembly being mostly complete, the next step was to revitalize the avionics hardware. The first step was to restore the connectivity between the controller and the flight computer. I attached the telemetry receiver to the flight computer, had to change some settings into controller and after a few tests it was working again. Then I had to ensure that the communication between the flight computer and the launch pad computer was working too. For running a full launch cycle, I could ensure that everything was working like it used to. With that out of the way, it was time to adjust the existing program. Until now, only Ascent features were implemented, 
and it was time to extend the program with the necessary landing features. I will go into more depth about our landing software in an upcoming video. To make sure our stabilization system works properly, we always test and tune it first with the help of a drone mode to test set. While we already have good stabilization parameters for the ascent stage, we don't have any data yet for the upper or landing stage. So the tuning of the descent stage was the next task on the to-do list. While everything has been going smoothly so far, it was on launch day that we encountered a major problem. Some functionality of our launchpad computer has apparently been fried on our last attempt. Specifically, 5 out of 6 pyro channels didn't work anymore. Of course, we already knew that the pyro channels design on the launch computer was flawed. However, we haven't yet gotten around to designing a new revision, as we thought that the old design would still suffice for a first attempt. A new revision of the board would only arrive in weeks, so we had to come up with some last minute quick fix instead. We tried many things, but in the end we settled with the following solution. We attached a single relay to our launch computer that should ignite all five engines simultaneously. The relay is powered directly by the battery, but is led through the pyro arm button to ensure proper safety. To conclude the preparations, we ran some final open rocket simulations with which we dialed in the flight parameters. To increase the chance of a landing, we opted for a maximum apogee of around 30 to 40 meters. With the engines that we used, we would reach almost 100 meters and with a lower tier engine, we would barely lift off. So our solution was to clamp the rocket for a relatively long time. However, this would lead to a very low thrust to weight ratio at liftoff. Due to that, we decided to remove the anemometer stand to make sure the rocket would not fly against it again. Also, for the first test flight, we decided on preparing everything in advance to minimize the time we have to spend on setting it up on the field. And with that, we were ready to launch. Out of all the outcomes we could have imagined, this was probably the worst. We spent a lot of time in the weeks leading up to the attempt, working on the landing simulation and preparing the vehicle. Of course, for a first try, we didn't expect it to land or to even come close. But not reaching the part where the rocket could show what it's got is devastating. It all comes back to one main point of failure. It turns out that the main reason for the failed attempt was that one of the engines didn't ignite. The rocket couldn't do anything against the off-centered thrust and the way too low thrust to weight ratio. Why the engine didn't ignite is still a miracle to us. In the post-flight inspection, we clearly identified a proper connection between the igniter and the relay. But at the same time, we couldn't see any indication of the igniter trying to ignite. Misignitions always had been a problem on our projects and moving forward the issue is likely to remain. This will only get worse as we need to ignite more and more engines. On this attempt alone, we would have had to ignite a total of 10 engines. And it's not just that the engines have to ignite, they also have to ignite simultaneously. And even then, a deviation of the ideal thrust curve of one engine leads to many problems along the way. On this attempt, a second and a third issue occurred. The stage didn't separate as planned and the board feature only triggered the parachute while not ceasing the execution of the landing attempt. So the rocket still triggered the descent stage ignition while the ascent stage was still attached. This was a software error which we didn't account for and which we will be able to fix easily. All in all, we are definitely not happy with this attempt and although we were unlucky with the misignition, we definitely saw that our design requires many improvements mainly on the hardware side moving forward. That's it from today's video. We hope you got some insights that will help you on your own maker journey. Thank you for your interest in aerospace and we will see each other soon.